So welcome to the Neuralace Podcast. I'm here with Blaze Sanders, right? Correct, yeah. Uh, he's the CTO of Space VR. Um, I understand Space VR is a company that makes satellites. Yeah. Um, which is like a super cool thing to do. My grandpa made satellites. He, he made the first uh, GPS satellite. Uh, he actually, I'm sorry, he led the team that uh, designed the specifications for the first one. So I'm, I, I very much uh, admire companies that make satellites. It's a really, it's a really cool thing. Um, and Space VR is a dream that uh, to put to put to allow all of us to go up and see what it's like to be in space via virtual reality in a real way. And uh, there's a lot of CGI space experiences out there, but we're going to capture full 20k resolution imagery of the space station as we fall away from it and just the beautiful Earth. <laughs> wow. So, goal is to give every person on Earth the overview effect. Um, would it be possible at some point to put the the um the 20k camera on the rocket itself as it's going up into space. Be- I can. I guess the biggest problem there would be like the uh, aerodynamics. Like, where do you place the camera? We did talk to Blue Origin about strapping it on the outside of the New Shepard, but couldn't quite figure out how to do it and not have it like break off. Oh yeah, yeah. Aerodynamics of uh, exit velocity are pretty rough. <laughs> we had some really cool renders of like aerodynamic uh, shields for the cameras, but. Never quite worked out. Oh, okay. <laughs> it would be cool, though. And then, so recently, um, I was at an uh, NVIDIA event, and I ran into uh, your friend Ryan, yep. who also works in Space VR, and he had just been awarded an NVIDIA uh, processor for robots. Uh, it was called, you know, TX2. It's their TX. new... Twice the AI is what they say. Yeah. And so now you guys are really excited, or it maybe have been for, since before that, um, probably, uh, about building a robot... Um, or telepresence on the satellite. Exactly. It's a full humanoid robot, about one and a half meters tall, and it's controlled by a VR suit, remote control. Wow. And so how is that, um, what What are the practical applications of that? Like, what would you be doing if you had tele- like hands? I mean, you could repair the satellite, I imagine. Yep, that's one of the use cases. It's a little farther down the line because satellite companies need to figure out how to repair satellites. So we're going for some Earth-based uh, use cases in the labor market that we think we can solve. Okay, so this is like this is something NASA did where they started um, coming up with it. NASA is not just a space company; they also have a bunch of you know Earth-based projects, underwater projects. Um, so that kind of makes sense. You want to put everything in space, but there's a lot of verticals where you can take what you're working on for space VR and then apply them to Earth. In very valuable ways. Exactly. NASA has the Robonaut 2 right on the space station now, so we're going to use some of their tech for the space side. But right now we're focused on ground-based robotics, and the Neural Ace has an important part to play in that. Wonderful. So um, let's talk about connecting Neural Ace to, uh, to space VR, um, or Neural Ace to telepresence. Um, what are some of the... Um, I mean, the, what that would mean is is you have a robot that responds to your nervous system the way you know to way to way to how your your hands actually move and what your hands touch and you you feel it so you have a true sense of presence remote presence um, as if you're actually there but then you'd have a different body so you'd have to get used to that but I mean it'd be <laughs> it'd be amazing yeah like uh, right now there's a lot of like gloves that you can wear for VR that give you a little bit of haptic feeling. And there's other input methods that let you move your arms around. But with the neural lace, you could think about doing something. Or if you were making a video game, think about turning on your shields and they would turn on. So so in, in the previous podcast, I laid out um, what I think are the two steps we need to achieve with neural lace. I'll just recap those real quick. And, um, so one of them is um, we need to um, we need to take a computer that's, that's computer vision that, you know, like the self-driving car or mixed reality concept where the computer is learning the concepts of everything around it. Um, it says this is a cup and this is a car and this is a person and the car is moving uh, really fast. And we want to make, the car needs to know if there's not a space in front of it. So it's categorizing objects around it um, and we need to apply that to neuroscience so that we can have this neural network that's doing computer vision. Okay, that's part A. And then part B is we need to have another neural network applied to live medical imaging 
mm-hmm. and then you need and a live medical imaging is like it could be a, it could be a, a chip that's implanted in your um, close to your to the midbrain to the midbrain uh, and it's or several chips and it's um, or just we just want to explain we want to focus on the area but it's medical imaging even if you do it with um, with a, with another type of medical imaging that's part B because now you have a neural network dedicated dedicated to what's going on inside your brain right and then you have a third neural network that's uh, at the apex of the two my so I so above A and B which is computer vision of objects and um, neural networks of brainwave data. Um, you have a third neural network that is com- looking for the similarities between the, the the world that you're seeing and the activity in your brain. And so that means that um, if you're seeing um, a car and with in, in the computer vision seeing the car, okay, and the computer vision is seeing the neural correlates of your brain activity while you're seeing the car. And then the third neural network is going to figure out what that pattern is, and that pattern, in term, not just in terms of, um, you know, we, I mean, we, I, we really for neuralize, we really have to go beyond EEG and beyond um, uh, diffusion tensor imaging with MRI. We, it's, it's about, it is about getting chips to focus on the data in the midbrain, and the reason for that is because all of our incoming senses, you know, from our eyes to our ears, they collide at the midbrain first before they connect with the rest of the neocortex. So that's like the point when our senses converge in the center of the brain. I'm making these like hand gestures, which you can't see on the radio, but yeah, so just just imagine that um, I have a hand gesture for your eyes and a hand gesture for your ears, and then I move my hands together, and where they come together is like at the thalamus um, or somewhere in the midbrain, and then, then... they connect with the rest of the neocortex, which is, you know, for the eyes, they're going to go to uh, the occipital lobes and the parietal lobes. And then you've got a whole bunch of information coming back at the same time back towards the thalamus, which is... Um, anyway, so the, so the point is, if we... So the idea is, if you tried to study from EEG, which is on top of your head, at that point, everything is um, scattered. It's all over the place. I mean, you have... Uh, there's there are maps of the brain that have been done in places like uh, Berkeley, where they say you know your concept of a, a cat and a dog has neural neural correlates over in this region of the brain, which I'm doing another hand gesture, so it's like I'm pointing to one part of my head, and then you have another concept of a, of, of a house and a motorcycle, which is going to be in a different region of the head completely. So now stuff gets all like scattered and distributed, sparse and distributed representations. And somehow, when you're perceiving them, they come together. Like you can perceive a dog at a house and in one picture, in one photo. And that's like different parts of your brain sort of like lighting up and then coming together. And maybe they're coming together uh, back, you know, maybe that's the, the back propagation when it comes back together to the center of your brain, to the midbrain to the thalamus, where your senses are coming in, maybe that information is coming together there. But when it's when it's in the neocortex, it's like all over the place. So the place we want to put our sensors is in the midbrain. And if we do that, then hopefully we can capture the photo when it's coming together before it scatters across the neocortex and or the, the sensor image. And the sensor image that we're, we want to capture is, um, is, le- is electromagnetic. It's um, because because your brain waves because we'll see there's, there's neurons that have electrical synapses and neurons that have chemical synapses, and but they're all generating a lot of brain wave activity, and the cells of the neurons have like the bo- the cell body has all this metal in it has um, you know like calcium ions positive ions on the outside of the cell body and it has potassium ions negative ions on the inside of the cell body, and those those you know the classic. Um, example in any neuroscience or computational neuroscience textbook is these charges are separating um, through the activity and then what happens is um, they separate enough they cause they cause um, the, the cell there's um, cell has to uh, depolarize this separation between positive and negative charges it's the same principle of lightning positive and negative charges separate in the sky and then all of a sudden you have a lightning bolt and in the brain you have an action potential but unlike the sky, the, the, there's, a, there's a path of least resistance that's 
that is the the um, axon body itself, the middle of the cell body, and that doesn't that and un, 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 unlike you know the standard neuroscience or neuro computational neuroscience textbook, it doesn't the action potential doesn't travel directly between two neurons. It's not it's it's actually um, it goes along the body of the cell, and you can see this in the illustration. But then it goes to the um, axon terminal or the the, the postsynapse. And, um, and inside the postsynapse, or is, is, is the synapse is so complex, it's like a little microcomputer. And, the, and the, so the, the, we used to say in computational neuroscience that, that you have to summarize whatever goes along the axon terminal, but, and, but into like a one or a zero. But now scientists have, have woken up to the idea that, wait a second, What's being sent is a lot more complex than that. It's not, you can't just summarize it as a one or a zero. It, it has a, has a wave, has an amplitude, has um, you know, it has uh, the 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 charges count. That there's information in in the in the voltage in terms of like its difference between like it could be if, if it has greater amplitude, that's information, right? Um, and then so that is is sent um, across the it is sent to the axon terminal or and then, if it's a chemical synapse, if it's—I mean, if it's electric synapse, it does transfer immediately to an, to an external. But if it's a chemical synapse, what happens is it triggers a bunch of uh, of, of neurotransmitters, ions, to, to pass through. Um, but what's but what's really 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 changing is see all the neurotransmitters have charges. So again, it's like charges in terms of like um, atomic charges, positive and negative charges. And this uh, synapse is like a computer. And it's it's and the dendrite itself is so so is the, here's the real question okay so the, this is like one of those things because I study like the dynamics of, of neuro of neural circuits for example um, the real question is if you have um, see a neuron now is sending its neurotransmitters to the next neuron but there are a, a finite number of neurotransmitters and each neuron is connected to somewhere between 10,000 and 200,000 other neurons. So when you see a neural circuit in the brain, which means the same group of neurons light up in a sequence, um, in a, but it's also a feedback loop, like it's a repeating sequence, how is it that sequence ever repeats more than once? And the, the weird thing is this, is that the neurons in a, in a feedback loop are not necessarily directly connected. So you'll see a neuron that lights up, let's say we call that point A, and then there's um, darkness for several connections, and then a neuron somewhere further down lights up in terms of uh, the brain neural imaging. And then, um, and then, and then uh, so I'm making another illustration with my hand, so then, um, <laughs> bear with me, audio listeners. So then there's a third point. Uh, now, so imagine a circle, and there's six points around the circle, and each of those six points is a neuron that's lighting up, and they're not necessarily directly connected, but they keep lighting up in that same circle over and over again, and that's what we call a neural circuit. But why would that ever happen? And so there's a lot of different, you know, network theories about why that, that might happen. But the most obvious, most obvious uh, possible solution to that is it's, it's, it's fundamentally about electromagnetism, yeah. and it could be. That the dendrite, which is the receiving terminal of the synapse, uh, it could be that the dendrite is. Um, yeah, dendrites are, you know, like more than eighty percent of, of the brain. I mean, they just they just take up a lot of space, and they're really complex. And they're, they're like it's like a tree, but it has like a tree with all these like notches or these hairs on it. They add the, the axon fibers, and, um, and so the dendrite could be doing a lot of interesting computations. People really analyze this. The dendrite itself could be like a, a sort of mini computer or a little microchip. Um, it's very fascinating. And so, but so the dendrite. So sorry. is that whole feedback loop a discrete step then, in, the, in some sense, or is it still analog in that feedback loop? As um, well? It could be a discrete step. Um, each part, each part of it could be a dis discrete step where. Um, the the dendrite itself could be like so. Imagine you have a bunch of, of dendrites that are competing, like a ten thousand or a hundred thousand uh, dendrites that are competing for the, the the signal that's coming from the the the, uh, the neuron that's in the, all the textbooks, right? Well, it could be that the dendrites um, 
the dendrite that receives it is the one that has the most negative charge in summary. And all the other ones have a slightly more positive charge. So it's creating a situation where you have like the lightning, like the lightning strike, where you have a separation of positive and negative charges. So the dendrite on the past the post uh, terminal is receiving, is actually setting up to, to it's, like, it's like saying, okay, I need to receive the next uh, call from this neuron. And it's achieving that with, uh, with the, uh, the polarization electromagnetism. Um, and so that's, how, that's, that's a hypothesis about how we have neural circuits. So if the brain is all, I mean, if the brain is operating sort of like in terms of electromagnetism, uh, in, 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 that would make sense because we see, because we capture all these brain waves. So we don't, what is a brain wave? Well, a brain wave is, is a wave of ions that's flowing throughout the entire brain and it has a, um, it has uh, all these uh, interesting properties. It has an angle, it has an amplitude, and it has a velocity, it has... And, but what does it mean to, to the... And so we measure, we can see these with EEG caps. We can capture them escaping our scalp, like like the solar flares escaping the, the sun's corona. Right? Nice. <laughs> I've worn a couple of those. Yeah, you've worn yeah, the, the EEG. It's, um, I've, I had an EEG business once, and um, it's, it's cool technology. You, have, you kind of have to be still, because your muscle movement will create a ton of noise, and then the, 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 pro, the chip processor has to work overtime to eliminate that, that noise from. Uh, anyway, so, so EEG is, is, uh, is, 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 still hasn't even reached its uh, full potential, especially you know, when you start applying the power of a supercomputer that goes in a self-driving car to your EEG analysis data. I mean, that just hasn't been done yet. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things for EEG and for MRI and DTI and for new brain computer interfaces. Uh, things that could um, possibly potentially revolutionize medical neuroscience. But one of the great, um, there's a lot of great new concepts around EEG is that you don't have to only study EEG. You can also study um, the eye movement, the, um, or what would they call it, you know, it's eye tracking, but also pupil dilation tracking and heart tracking. You can put all of these on a single sheet. Um, there's a software called Neuropipe. It's open source, um, created by Tim Mullen and it's, and there's other softwares. I think NVIDIA has their own now. Microsoft has their own now. But it allows you to take multiple kinds of sensor data. And unless they're using the open source one, which has been around for a while. But it allows you to combine multiple kinds of sensors, any kinds of sensors, into a single sheet. So it's sort of time lock. And it's, ti it's ti time locking the data so that you can run AI process. So the deep learning can, uh, uh, you know, it's great for observing, you know, um, like, it's great for monitoring things, like like for electric companies, for monitoring power distribution over time and predicting where that power is going to go. So you could easily imagine that as a way to monitor, like, when, let's say that someone, uh, you're wearing augmented reality glasses and you've got EEG and you've got um, a heart rate monitor and you've got um, the eye tracking and pupil dilation stuff and all of this is, on the, and maybe you have a watch and the watch has like all these biosensors too. And it's all going into one sheet and you know, and the heart pendant, and like all these great bio trackers, and you've got motion controllers, and you've got your head tracking, and and you at the same time you've got the, you've got all the computer vision stuff going on as categorizing objects, and so then you have deep learning. Uh, it's noticing that when you um, see a virtual box and a kitten jumps out of it, and maybe it'll, it'll notice your heart rate had a spike at the same time your brain wave had a spike uh, in some region, and then your uh, your, your pupils uh, widen slightly, and then um, and then, uh, then uh, someone, a new person walks into the room, and you have another kind of reaction between the heart and the eye and the brain and, all, and the watch. And, and so um, that's that's a way of, you know, when we do medical imaging, it doesn't, it should be multimodal. It's not let's only do EEG or let's only do MRI. And 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 this is already. The trend that we're seeing in science, scientists are already combining. Like, okay, well, what can we stick? Because you know, the, the MRI machine obviously is magnetic, so you're limited in terms of you know what you can design to to mix with that. But there are cool things that people are coming up with, and um, so um, th so getting back to um, the brain is magnetic, and that means if we can figure out um, 
So if you if you if we're setting your brain while we're setting your environment, and let's say that you decide to uh, um, build a say that you're working on your computer and you're and you're working on creating uh, like a, you're just implementing a, a voice recognition API for your robot, and then the computer is watching you do that, and it's watching your, the neural correlates, and the neural correlates is is also it's not only your brainwave activity. Uh, but it's also your eye tracking and your pupil dilation, and the computer is figuring out. Okay, so this pattern of working on the voice rec on um, the voice recognition API for your robot is exactly uh, is exactly matching. We, we've we've found the brainwave pattern that's matching what Blaze is doing on his computer, or maybe it's and we've isolated that from. The computer itself, like we're getting very distinct. And this brainwave pattern is for the computer, and this is for what he's working on specifically. And so then the computer could tell you at some point this network, because it has this, these concepts of of um, how all these signals um, meet together. The computer t- can tell you if you if you if you turn off if you like uh, put a curtain in front of the computer's cameras, so it can no longer see what you're doing. It can only see your neural correlates. It should be able to tell you from your neural correlates that you're working on the computer and you're working on the application. And that means that we have, um, you know, the voice recognition application. That means we have now identified the tempo spatial uh, ionic brainwave pattern of Blaze working on the computer on voice recognition for his robot. <laughs> I think some of the first use cases for the neural lace will definitely be in the medical field, like solving Parkinson's disease. Like that seems like a great first it, use for it. Absolutely. Um, we have to, that's, so the first step to solve a neural lace is to identify those brainwave patterns to decode what brainwaves mean. The second step is to identify the um, communication protocol, like a network communication protocol. So imagine if our brain was organized like a network or like the internet, which is a very popular idea. I mean, packets, it, like packets. Yeah. So is it more like TCP or more like UDP, the transmission control protocol or the user data gram protocol? Um, is it in TCP? It's like, you know, you need a connection. You need a almost like TCP is like a feedback loop. Uh, UDP is like you just throw packets of data. It's faster. It's great for mass multiplayer. And these are different. The, and then those are the top two network protocols. And below that, there are other there are many other you know um, network protocols like HTTP. Right. So the question is, if we can figure out the network protocol of electromagnetism, we can create artificial neurons or chips that can send and receive electromagnetic information. That's your brain for it. Once we have the knowledge of how to communicate with the brain, you're right. There's a lot of practical medical applications. And one of those is reconnecting spines. Um, because what happens is the spine is severed, and so no, the neurons between two points are no longer communicating. And if we know that how that works, uh, if we know how neurons talk to each other, we can reconnect the spine. It's very practical. It's not we're not in the realm of science fiction anymore. Yeah, uh, this is just bridging a physical gap. Yeah, almost. And it also comes the, the same idea applies to um, artificial limbs, right? So if you had your arm chopped off, and now someone gives you this really great artificial mm-hmm. limb, you can physically connect it to your nervous system. So you can um, move the arm as intuitively as your original arm, the artificial arm. Just like Luke Skywalker's arm from, from uh, Return of, uh, what is it, uh, Empire Strikes Back, right? Episode 5. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So yeah, that's exactly what we want to do at Space VR is let people with Parkinson's go back to work by working through a robot and also like vets that have had an arm blown off, like letting them go back to work through a VR robot. So so what your telepresence robot as space VR means that when we when we have a brain for it that allows us to convert electromagnetic waves into something the computer understands. That means someone who's sitting in a bed who can't physically move can teleport into your robot and have the presence to walk around and have and sort of like, you know, do business through that robot and their brain will function as if it was their body. Yeah, close to the movie surrogate, like the movie surrogate. Yeah, yeah it's a little scary. <laughs> Hopefully, we don't go in that direction a hundred percent. But there's definitely that direction, like letting people be themselves and control their own lives. Another um, thing is this: is that we're really talking about neural lace. It's not just brain computer interface. 
it's also uh, it's it's I mean it's brain computer interface, but it's bidirectional. Or what that means is it's not only can you uh, read information, you can also write information. So in, a, in the medical application, positive medical application for being able to write to the brain would be like if someone had some really traumatic traumatic memories, or if they, uh, I'm, you know, I'm talking about like you can actually. Um, what I believe is realistic. I mean, because so, we're talk- you know, memories are like, again scattered over the whole neocortex potentially. That's what we. That's what many people believe. So that might be a little bit hard to edit. But what you might be able to through a brain port that is connected to your thalamus um, or pointed at your thalamus from from somewhere outside of you, like with wireless EG, um, with with you know, there are ways to non invasively stimulate. Um, uh, like with ultrasonic uh, sound, they're using that to do um, surgery for for, for women who, um, and so that you don't have to actually cut into the the womb area. Um, and you could you could apply this to the brain as well to stimulate um, that core part of of, of a person, the, the mid midbrain, and, and instead of actually putting a chip on there. And so now we have not we have non-invasive possibility. In fact, I tried a wireless EEG device, first one I've ever heard of, at uh, CES recently, CES 2017. So that technology is coming. So like the idea that you need to have a chip implanted is just, I think we're going to do it for research purposes, but this will become a commercial product. Um, and when it becomes a commercial product, there won't be any chips that need to be installed. Elon hopes that you can just inject it into your bloodstream and not, not have to necessary. do not even necessary. Like why would like all you have? I mean, you could have it completely external, and it would still work just the same. Like wireless. I mean, yeah. So I mean, I guess some people might experiment with injecting robots into their bloodstream because there's a whole bunch of cool things robots can do. There's a lot of blood that goes to your brain, so it'll go right there. Um, and another thing is, you know, potentially. Um, you could live longer if you have robots that are concerned about your health. On a <laughs> but but the one one comment was you know if you if your um, if your robots get hacked, you know if you're wearing if you're wearing a baseball cap, you know, or if you're wearing like a brain computer interface under your nose or something that's pointed at your thalamus, but it's not actually you can just pull it off if there's a problem. If but if the robots are in your bloodstream, it's like well, how do you get them out? You know, maybe like a resonance frequency that destroys them all instantly and doesn't hopefully hurt any of your body cells. An EMP pulse. You press the button and it disables all your electronics and stuff. Maybe. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, some of the artificial cells that we're building now, we're building them out of DNA. So that's kind of, you know. Even harder to shut down. It's even harder to shut down because now they're built out of the same material we're built out of. So. Um, these are, I mean, these are great ideas, but yeah, but it's, 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 um, I think maybe the first commercial versions of Neuralist would be non-invasive. Maybe the, maybe there will be some, um, some of the first medical, uh, versions of, of, of Neuralist. Uh, well, I mean, there we're already like when someone, uh, is, uh, an epileptic and we have to cut it to the brain anyways, that's the, when we're putting in grids of electrodes and doing science experiments and, and, uh, you know, with the patient's permission, of course. But if you have to do surgery anyways, then that's a good excuse to do a brain implant. Um, but if you don't have to do it, then it's like you really kind of, you don't want to do that as an elective surgery because anytime you do surgery, you're risking the patient's life. Um, so it's it's um, a lot easier to take off commercially too if people don't have to go under the knife just to get this device. So. Um, one thing... Um, yeah, so practical applications, um, remote presence. Um, it should make um, remote. Um, it should make virtual reality more interesting, more fun. Yeah, more natural. <laughs> like I want to pick up my sword or turn on my shield now. Or if you're playing a puzzle game, move these objects around on the screen. So, um, and I'm really, have you seen Sword Art Online? No, what's that? Um, well, it's like it's like it's, it's an animation from Japan. It's sort of a, it starts with the same concept as the movie The Matrix, where people are putting. But it's it's sort of similar. But but what's different about Sword Art Online is people have a headset, and they put on the headset and they lie down on their bed, and it covers their eyes, and they go to their body goes to sleep, but they wake up inside this virtual world that's a computer program. But they 
experience it as if they're actually there. And their image has changed. So, like, they look, you know, in some cases, they like, there, there's the main character, um, he, he notices that his, 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 his hair is different, and et cetera. And the graphics are not the same as reality, but it's like Sword Art Online is this great sort of like um, um, imagination of what the fu- what the future might be like when we use VR with Neuralix. And so it's like you get it's like you can go through the metaverse, but it's such an incredibly strong feeling of presence because you're um, you the the imagine if you look around it at the room around you or the world around you if you're outside that um, all this is is virtual reality and be in so a realistic application of what we're building here because I'm talking about you know a, a brain port that targets the thalamus we're not necessarily going to be able to change your memories because those are sparse and distributed across your palmian cortex but realistically I think we're going to be able to, to alter the room that you're in so that you're um, <clears throat> you're not you, you it looks like you're in a different place than you are or it looks like you're in the room that you're in but all of a sudden the walls could could expand for miles or the um, or the sky could um, change color or stuff and it's like stuff in your reality like you like I'm holding I'm doing gestures with my hands again of course for the, for the call it's like all of a sudden you hold out your hand and something appears in your reality appears in your reality that's not actually there um, so that's the kind of stuff that we're um, the capabilities and other capabilities are let's say that you um, there's a crime and there's a, a victim and a defendant well if they um, if you have this um, connected to them while they're experiencing you can record what they're saying and what they're hearing and then so you can download that experience to a computer because you're, you know, again, translating the brain waves. You have the brain waves communication protocol. The computer can take those um, advanced, complex uh, brain wave holograms with infinite typology and reduce them to a simple bit code. Like, um, and, and this idea comes from like uh, in the study of of um, um, black holes and the idea that um, everything. Like the idea is that everything is on the, the surf, everything could be on the, the two dimensional horizon of a black hole, sort of compressed into a two dimensional reality. And this is possible because with a two dimensional strip of a two dimensional sphere, um, you can store all the data necessary for a 3D world. And so we're experiencing, like at the quantum level, there, there, is no, there isn't necessarily a real space in real time. We could have a perfect two-dimensional um, copy of this entire universe. That works this 3D, 4D universe, right? And this could all be existing. Right now, we're experiencing it as 3D, but it could also be all the information could be in a two-dimensional script somewhere at the same time as it's 3D. And that's the weird part of relativity. I mean, it's just, it's kind of I'm not the first species to probably think of this, so <laughs> we're probably living in a simulation ourselves. So. <laughs> It could be. It could be. I mean, there's the, 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 the you know, there's the Elon Musk's simulation argument. Um, and I'm not sure he's the first one to say it, but he's saying that popularized it by saying that, that there's the odds of that if, if it's possible to create a simulation that's as good as reality, then it probably has happened. And, and more than likely or not, we're probably in the simulation. My, the only counter argument I can think of is that um, you're adding uh, a plus one to the potential complexity of the universe. So the odds, the odds are, you know, if you're using like Occam's razor, the odds are that the simplest possible explanation is probably the right one. And so the simplest one would be that we're not in a simulation. And it's, it's so statistically more complex to, to be in a simulation. That's the only counter argument that I have. But I mean, it really is plausible that we could be in a simulation. And when you were talking about the crime thing, uh, is that almost like the minority report where you'd be tracking everyone's well, thoughts and they might do a crime in the future? Well, let's say that the, the way our brains work is that you know we have grids of cells that are collecting um, novel input uh, from sensor data. And they have such a complexity to their organization that they, they can record every possible input in a unique way. Um, and, and this this is this part of the fact that we have you know trained connections makes in, in our in, between our brain cells makes this possible. Um, 
um, but so the so the idea is um, that that uh, you know when the computer is recording a memory and the the memory the memories uh, is recording connections between memories of things and this is um, this is creating sort of a concept of how all of these lines and edges and colors fit together and this now is this the concept of a tree and the concept of a tree is this the concept of the connections between this body of line and edges and this temporal spatial dimension uh, in front of me. And um, so what that means is that um, in terms of in terms of minority report, memories become our predictions of what's going to happen next. So memories become our beliefs. So everything, this is from the book on intelligence by Jeff Hawking. So every 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 thought that we have is a prediction, every sense that we have is a prediction. So if we take see the table in front of us, we have a prediction of how it it should look and how it would sound if we knocked on it. And we have a prediction of like how it would feel if we touched the texture of the table. And if we touched the table and a chicken popped out, that would be very surprising. Um, because we have a prediction of what the way it should be based on our memories, our memories of him and our predictions, our beliefs. The idea is every thought that we have is a prediction of the causes of in the context of movement, the causes of movement in the context of the, our brains are for highly organized um, movement. So if you compare plants to animals, um, you would say that plants don't have brains because they don't have highly, they have movement, but they don't have highly coordinated movement at the same scale as an animal, right? You know, yeah. if you do a time lapse, you can see plants move towards the sun and stuff like that. But but with animals have can get up and walk around and run around and they can, in, in, in at the when you get to the human level, humans can like plan to, put a date on a calendar and plan to meet. I mean, that's highly coordinated. That's what we're talking about. It's not just movement, it's highly coordinated movement. So maybe that's what brains are for. And if brains are for movement and all our thoughts are predictions in the context of predictions, memories that become predictions in the context of causes that predict movements in the context that our brains are just for movement and all our thoughts are movement, even the abstract thoughts that we have come down to highly coordinated movement. Like if I think of, well, what if what if I, you know, my grant, like my highly coordinated thought was, uh, for me, it would be like my grandfather was on the team that made the first GPS satellite. So that would make me want to help Space VR and, and help them make a robot because that would, you know, that somehow, you know. And so <clears throat> it's just that's a highly coordinated movement in that I'm like taking two different pieces of data from across a vast amount of time and combining those. And um, so, but still, those are abstract thoughts. And, but it's no different from like, you know, I'm predicting that this piece of, uh, that this table feels a certain way and sounds a certain way and, and this ends in a certain word. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, um, that's the, so, and, and so beyond narrow lace, um, it's going to be very, uh, the next uh, step is, um, that's so I'm giving away how to build narrow lace and, you know, in this podcast. And I want to talk to, um, you know, great people who are working on great projects. Um, you know, computer science, space science, uh, virtual reality, uh, spatial computing is very important um, because it's kind of what we're doing in our heads. We're doing spatial computing. So if we want to relate to um, someone's experience, like if, let's say they, they there was a crime and they recorded their experience because they had this neurotransmitter and then um, they're able to share it in court now. And you can share it in court. So the judge doesn't need to... And the jury, they don't need to have the neural interface because now, because we have a spatial computing, we can turn someone's experience into a VR experience. So you just put on a headset and you can see a, the computer recreating um, what happened to the victim from their point of view and what happened to the defendant from their point of view. Perfect record. Hopefully it doesn't get tampered with in any way, but... It's, um, it's theory right now, but um, I believe it's possible with... Um, with the direction we're going with our lace. So, very good. Final thoughts? Um, yeah, I just, we know Elon's timelines are always uh, off by a little bit, so I think it'll definitely happen. He just needs to find the right people to implement implement the uh, base features. Like, uh, there's lots of opportunity there. Both to make money, both to help people. Um, so, definitely interesting technology to watch out for. So, so, uh, Blaze, what do you want to, um, 
in terms of your project, uh, Space VR. So you're working on a telepresence robot, but it's for the Earth and it's for um, patients who may not be able to move to hospitals, right? Yeah. So our first satellite is the Overview 1. It launches here in August, and that will be a 360 camera transmitting images back down around 20, Christmas time. 20K. 20K, yeah. We built our own custom <coughs> camera. It has eight 4K sensors. What is, what is the um, frequency rate of information traveling from satellite to the ground? So we're going to release two hours worth of video every month, so about two 15-minute videos every week, kind of YouTube style. Okay, so it's not yet at the point where you're going to be on the satellite live. Not yet, but the human stuff, uh, our robot's going to be live streaming. So um, that was the MVP, get something into space first, get a bunch of cool content, figure out the technology, Great. and then do live streaming next. So in terms of, um, you know, how are you uh, going about uh, building your robot? What if you have, you obviously got the new uh, processor, what was it called again, TX2? Uh, TX2, yeah, so it's a single board Linux computer. Um, so build, building and uh, creating the demo based off of a commercial robotic arm with a 360 camera head. Um, and then there's a little bit of programming and control system stuff that we're doing on the TX2 uh, to map VR inputs from a Vive controller, and from there, uh, we just scoop ice cream and hand it out to people in Dolores Park. So, <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Yeah, so keep working on that telepresence robot. Um, that's going to be very, very applicable to Neuralace as soon as we're able to get that component out to you. Um, yeah. like but, uh, bandwidth, uh, we type really slowly on keyboards. We need a faster <laughs> way to control robots. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I would say look into eye tracking too as far as the interface. Well, I mean, that's a whole... That'll be key for our 360 camera. If we know which way you're looking, we can turn off most of the cameras and save bandwidth on the video distribution side. So What I was going to say was your eye moves so fast you can type with your eye as far faster than you can type with your fingers. Uh, it's so fast. It's uh, we, people underestimate how fast their eyes move. You could really, you know. <laughs> even outside the normal like uh, vibration. What is that? The cicada. Cicada. Yeah. No. Yeah. You control um, out, right outside of cicada movement. Um, controlled eye movement is extremely fast, and you really could um, type faster than your fingers could. Uh, far faster. Very Thank cool. you very much, Blaze. You're very welcome.